reports that we've seen from the EPA and the Department of Defense that have been issued, they state that there are about 10,400 abandoned uranium mines throughout the entire U.S., primarily concentrated in 15 western states. That means that there are about 10 million people who live within 50 miles of an abandoned mine. I'm going to show you a short documentary that it's actually a rough cut, it's a work in progress from a site visit that myself and some other folks who were part of the Clean Up the Mines campaign did when we went to South Dakota to launch this effort, Clean Up the Mines. We went around Earth Day to a few sites, and you'll see it in the film, but we went to Mount Rushmore, we went to Redshirt uh, Village, who I guess we have some folks from Pine Ridge tonight, uh, and hopefully we'll hear um, if there's something that's missing from this film, you can speak more directly to uh, if I make a mistake talking about y'all's plans and let me know. Um, but we also went to Riley Pass, which is also a sacred site in Cape Hills area, and a school called Ludlow School. Uh, you'll see that in this film. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna show the film because it, it speaks for itself. I also wanted to um, state that Charmaine Whiteface from Defenders of Black Hills, who is an originator of this bill uh, that, that I'll talk a little bit after this film about uh, as well, and, and we'll also talk about what you can do to support our campaign to clean up this toxic threat of abandoned uranium mines. Um, but this, Charmaine is, is, she can't join us tonight because of health impacts due to exposure to radiation it's with some of the sites that will be um, shared in this film. And so she was supposed to be here tonight, but she can't be here. Uh, and so, but she's featured through this uh, a short film, so we'll let her speak for herself through, through this rough cut. Again, it's about uh, 15 minutes. Tasty, you can't see it unless you have specialized equipment. Uh, so if you can help us, address this invisible threat and, and make visible what we can do to ensure that we have healthy communities. We invite you to be part of this campaign. Uh, so there will be other opportunities. If you sign our emailing list, if you send the mailing list um, here as well uh, to be able to plug in. Because what we need here is not just a single issue campaign, but we need a movement for healthy communities, for just communities. And this is the intersection of environmental and social justice, because as indigenous people, Wherever there's an environmental crisis, there's a cultural crisis because we're people of the earth. But this isn't just an indigenous issue. This is a, human, a crisis uh, for human people and environments and animals as well. So thank you for being here and thank you for joining us in this struggle to clean up the mines. So please welcome Helen Jacquard. She's with Clean Up the Mines and Veterans for Peace. You can have um, Clean Up the Mines and Veterans for Peace are going to try to undertake a project to implement a reverse osmosis system in Registered Village. It's a community of about 60 people, or 60 families, or homes. Um, it's going to be expensive, but we're dedicated to see if we can do something to help the people there. Um, at the very least, it's a pilot project, but hopefully we'll be able to get enough support to bring clean water to lots of people that are affected by these mines. As you saw, the Cheyenne River is very severely polluted, and so they cannot drink the water without risking cancer now or cancer down the road, 10, 20, or 30 years down the road. And of course, when it's worse, the younger your exposure. So we're talking about, um, it, and it's worse for women than men. So if you're talking about um, a baby girl being exposed to this water, it's seven times worse than if you're talking about an adult man exposed to this water as far as long-term possibility of getting cancer. Um, as you can see from the slide above, this is uh, a little bit of research I've been doing to be able to map the location of the uranium mines based on data from the EPA and from the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, so I've got over 10,000 data points on this map. And I decided since we're in Washington, D.C., that I'd go ahead and see what mines might be close to where we are right now. 
So this is not a highly mined area, uh, but you can see that there are three abandoned uranium mines or prospects, and in, in this area there are actually holes in the ground of prospects rather than actual producing mines. But it happens that one of these mines, um, the Coles Hill Uranium Prospect, happens to be the largest uranium deposit in the world. Go ahead, go. yeah. Yeah, that, that was it. Um, so you guys might be faced with a huge uranium problem here in the future, if that ever gets, gets going. Right now there's a ban on uranium mining in Virginia. Um, um, and on the next slide, I just wanted to do one more. Oh, go past that. This is how uranium mines can contaminate the water and the soil and the air. So you can see that when you have a classic. So. I got really excited about this project when I learned about um, what was happening in my own state on the Spokane Indian Reservation in Washington State and found out about the Midnight Mine, which out of six really big abandoned uranium mines, there's two lakes on that property that are acid, acid mine drainage lakes. If you put a spoon in those lakes, they come out melted. That's how acidic this stuff can be. Um, so one of the things that the Klee talked about was there's no national mandate to clean up these mines, but there's also no national standard for how well you clean them up. And so what's going on to some extent in the mine cleanups is they're just pushing the toxic dirt around and saying that it's cleaned up. And what really needs to happen is you need to put the waste into a trench that's lined so that it's protected from getting wet and you need to cover it with a lining and then put soil and grass on top if you're going to remediate the soil. And you have to deal with any water that could come in, in contact with the uranium mine and its waste. Um, one of the things that happens is when uranium is exposed to oxygen, the degree to which it can dissolve in water increases. And so that's the, the method by which they're doing in situ leach mining, which is where they put some chemicals in the water that oxygenate the water, pump it into the ground, wait for it to dissolve, and suck it back up just like they do in fracking. But what just disturbing the soil exposes the uranium to the air, which oxygenates it, it changes it from, hex, from uh, quadrivalent to hexavalent uranium, and that makes it more dissolve, more easily dissolved in the water. So when you do a cleanup, you have to be very careful about how you do it so that you're not just moving more uranium around all over the place. So this is a huge problem. And we look forward to seeing some good legislation to say we have to clean up the mines and we have to do it right so that we can make sure that the soil and the water is cleaned up when we're done. Clean up the mines. This is something now that these, walk, these corporations just walked away from and this toxicity continues to go on. It's been more than 60 years now and that's why we say that it's really time to clean up the mines. And, um, there's different forms of radiation. If people are close to the mines, you can get gamma radiation, um, and that just goes right, right through you, uh, through your skin. Or you can be exposed to radon gas that you breathe in, which is associated with cancer. But in addition to that, just the, the dust um, from these mines, this is pulverized rock, contains, ra contains uranium and other heavy metals. And this blows through the air. It gets into the water. It gets into the soil. It's taken up by the plants. It's taken up by the fish. Or if the rain comes down into these mine areas, that water flows down into the water table and flows out. So this is not a problem that just stays in one area. 
it really travels. And then if you look at the map, we're really talking about the breadbasket of this country. We're talking about where you know crops are grown, where uh, cattle are eating this grass, they're drinking this water. Nobody has really studied the magnitude of the health impacts or the health effects of this. And so we, that's one of the things with our campaign that we think is very important, that we study the health impacts that we educate communities about the health impacts and most importantly how to protect themselves and ultimately that we can care for and compensate people who have been affected by these mines. This is a this is a big lift that we have, but it really has to be done. It's been way too long. And so as you've heard, the radiation and heavy metal poisoning is associated with cancers. We see high rates of different kinds of cancers lung cancer, thyroid cancers, an unusual type of brain cancer. Um, it causes kidney disease, it causes birth defects, um, it causes arthritis, neurological effects. Um, and people are exposed to this radiation and these heavy metals, they don't know that they're being exposed and they don't have the effects right away. Um, some of these genetic effects may not show up until the next generation or even farther down. So. Um, so I'm going to stop there with the health effects. You can read more about it through our fact sheets at cleanupthemines.org. And I'd like to bring up uh, Lauren Pagel, who's with Earthworks. And she uh, does policy work on hard rock mining. So we want to welcome Lauren Pagel. Uh, my name is Lauren Pagel. I'm the policy director at Earthworks. Uh, we work on mining and oil and gas extraction issues. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the sort of policy universe um, around uranium mining um, and sort of how we got to where, where we are today um, and the struggle that continues as well as hopefully um, a few little rays of hope um, uh, on Capitol Hill uh, and also in the regulatory agencies, the EPA in particular. So um, in the mid, uh, 1800s, um, the rush to uh, for gold um, was high, and the miner 49er um, heading out to California um, to try to strike it rich was quite common. Um, and so, to govern um, this type of mining, which is called hard rock mining, um, which includes gold, copper, silver, uranium. Um, the Congress passed a law called the 1872 Mining Law, and it was signed into law by President Ulysses S. Grant, uh, and it is still the law that governs hard rock mining on our federal lands today. Um, so national forest, if you want to build, uh, if you want to mine for gold, if you want to mine for uranium, if you want to mine for copper, um, in say the Black Hills National Forest um, or many other places in the West, the 1872 mining law is the law by which you will go about that mining. It does allow mining companies to go onto our public lands for free um, and mine um, uranium or gold or whatever type of metal you would want. Um, so not only are we starting the landscape with abandoned mines, toxic pollution, etc., cetera, um, but we're actually not getting anything in return for it. Um, and that issue has um, led to this abandoned uranium mine problem. Um, abandoned uranium mines is just part of the story. Um, if you look at all hard rock mines throughout the West, there's actually more than 500,000 abandoned hard rock mines. Um, the uranium mines are obviously uh, have more serious issues in terms of radiation, um, but those other abandoned gold and copper mines also have acid mine drainage, arsenic, lead, cadmium, um, running into our water um, and polluting our air. So bad news um, in terms of that law, but the good news is that there are efforts to reform the 1872 mining law, um, which will have an impact both on cleaning up the mines and on currently operating and potential future uh, mines. Uh, the 1872 mining law reform legislation was introduced just a couple weeks ago um, by Congressman DeFazio from Oregon um, and Congressman Rahal from Arizona. 
and it is HR 50, if any of you want to check it out. Um, it would create, it would actually charge a fee um, to mining companies who are going to mine on public land, and all of that money would go into an abandoned mine land fund that would clean up these old mines. Um, it also uh, creates the space for um, to deny mines um, for and say, you know what, this is not a good use of public lands in certain situations or in maybe many situations um, when you have competing uses. Um, does the sacred site trump the mine? Does the trout stream or recreation area? Um, and it would create a process to determine that um, that would hopefully um, lead to those more sustainable uses winning out in the end. How far the EPA goes in terms of really setting strong health standards um, for um, uranium, thorium, radium, etc., in in our water um, is sort of up to them at this point. Um, that rule uh, has not been proposed yet, but we we think that it's going to come out in October.